And I'm so glad that you're here today. Like I said, it's my, it's my favorite place. And uh, what I want to do is start off uh, by reading from Psalm 8. So if you have your Bibles, would you grab it and open to Psalm 8? That's our anchor passage for today. Psalm 8 says, Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. You've covered the heavens with your majesty. From the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you've established a stronghold on account of your adversaries in order to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I observe your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him? You've made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all the sheep and oxen, as well as the animals in the wild, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea that pass through the currents of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how magnificent is your name throughout the earth. Can we pray? Father, today we give this morning to you. I pray that your words would be yours and not mine. God, would your spirit move if there's something I need to change or say differently what I hear from you today because I believe your spirit is a living spirit, alive and at work in this place. God, we give you the glory and the honor. Amen, amen. Why don't you say hello to somebody around you, take your seat and we'll jump into our message. Well, thank you all for being here. If you're a first-time guest, I'm so thankful that you took the time to be here today. Can we give it up for our first-time guests? Awesome. Well, today we're continuing on our uh, sermon series called Mirror, Mirror. And today I want to, I have a question to ask you, which is the title of my message, and that's whose story are you telling? Whose story are you telling? As we look at the effect of the storyteller on our life and how the author and main character of our story affects our identity. Does anyone else in here, are you with me in that you hate the sound of your own voice? Anybody hate the sound of their own voice? I remember recording voicemail back in the 1900s, and uh, you'd have to listen back to approve it to, and hear your own voice, and my eyes start to water, I get all cringy. I have a full-on physiological reaction. And so it's kind of a hazard of this position because I get to listen to this back at some point, and I, will probably, I won't be weeping. It will just be my eyes watering from how cringy my voice sounds to me. Because you guys hear a different voice than what I hear in my own head. In fact, you see a different person up here than who I see. I can go in front of a full-length mirror, but, but it doesn't look, that's not the person I remember. So when I look up at this screen over here, which I won't do because it's cringy, and I hear the voice that comes out of my head, what I remember in my brain is the 30-year-old me who's in pretty good shape, played soccer every week, like all that kind of stuff. Not that guy up there, the old guy on the, on the side screen. That's not who I remember. So your experience of me right now isn't even how I necessarily see myself. And so as we talk about identity and lean into identity, have you ever found yourself asking the question, how well do I actually know myself? Because that's what I ask when I, I look over at that guy. That's so weird to me because that's not how I remember myself looking. But one of the ways that we tend to convey and communicate stories is through social media. Am I right? So I want to do a little experiment today. Um, think of your profile picture for whatever your most used social media platform is, your profile picture. We're going to do a quick survey. I just need some hands raised on this. How many of you for your profile picture have a selfie or some kind of portrait, like headshot, that kind of thing? How many of you have a, like a selfie? A2, how many of you guys? What do you guys... You got selfie of yourself, like a headshot kind of thing. How many of you have a picture with somebody else? Whether it's your kids or maybe it's even your dog or a uh, significant other, all right? All right, all right. How many of you have you doing something, like rock climbing or skiing or something like that, right? How many of you just have like an emoji or some landscape because you are afraid of getting your identity stolen and don't want anybody to know who you are? Yeah, yeah, I see you, I see you. 
I see you. So I want to do something with me because what I've found is that our profile pictures typically, whether consciously or subconsciously, trying to portray a story about who we are. So in all my vulnerability, I have uh, my Instagram profile picture up here on the screen. And that is a giant head. Like that is like the biggest head. So that's me. If you don't see the resemblance, this is me. Um, we are at the Grand Canyon. And um, I took this selfie of myself during the sunset. And I'm wearing my Utah hat because so, I want you to know that I'm from Utah, even though I'm in Arizona at the moment. I have um, showing you that I'm super adventurous, camping explorer because of my flannel shirt and my puffy jacket. <laughs> and my little smirk tells you that I might be a fun kind of guy and, and I probably know something that you don't know, right? <laughs> so look, my, my point isn't to put that up there to make you self-conscious of your own profile picture. My, my point is to put up there, we're all trying to communicate a story about who we are whether we think about it on purpose or we don't. I, I mean, when I originally put that up, I'm like, hey, I like this picture. It's kind of good. But when I think about it, I'm, there's more that we're trying to do. So what, what are you trying to tell? Maybe your profile picture says, hey, I'm really fun, or I like to travel, or I love my kids, or I'm available. You know? <laughs> you guys, all kinds of stuff up there, right? Get a little suck in the gut. Get that suck in the gut. Check just real quick. Stop breathing until the picture's taken or the flattering chicken wing. You know, sort of picture on there. You're trying to convey something about who you are and the story they are. Because here's the reality. We live in a first-person life. We live in a first-person life where we are always putting ourselves in as the main character. I remember when Nintendo 64 came out with this video game, GoldenEye. Any of you old enough to remember GoldenEye? GoldenEye was the first-person first shooter game that I can remember. And it was so great because I wasn't now a little plumber going side to side on the screen. It was me doing the action as the main character, fully involved in this narrative and this story. In the first person life, we get to be the hero. We get to be the main character. We get to be the driver of the storyline. And if anybody in scripture had the claim to be a main, a main character, to drive a storyline, it would be David. So we're going to look at a kind of a brief synopsis of David's life today and see what he learned about trying to be the main character in a story where God should be the main character. So David's the author of Psalm 8 that we read earlier. Psalm 8's inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it tells us also some of David's personality, some of who he is. We read a lot about David in, in Samuel and Chronicles in Scripture, but it's the Psalms where he writes about himself. It's not other people telling, talking about him. We get to hear his first-person account. David's an actual person. There's archaeological evidence for King David that he ruled in Judah and Israel in the time when Scripture says it is. It's not a made-up myth. It's not fictional it's not a good moral of the story at the end. His life is a mess. But God has put it in scripture so that we get to learn from it. So today, lean in with me as we talk about David. So David was a shepherd, a musician, a poet, a warrior, and eventually a king. He was the youngest of eight brothers. And have you got eight, eight or more in your family? Everybody the youngest? Sorry. Um, Disregarded by his brothers and his father, he was sent out in the field to watch sheep. Often, David was just an afterthought. But he was anointed to be king as a youth. He was anointed while the current king still lived. He was from a completely different family line. He got anointed in front of his older brothers. He was a usurper, if you will. He was a threat to the monarchy. Then, while being completely downplayed by all of those around him, he defeated a giant with a simple sling. With everything on the line, his life, the existence of his country, but more importantly, the credibility of God. He did this in full view of the king that he was anointed to replace. That king who should have been the one to fight. 
David used the same sling he had used to kill lions and bears while he was tending sheep. The king saw him as a threat. He attempted to kill David multiple times. David served the king as a musician in his court and then as a soldier in his army. And David's best friend was the king's son and his wife, the king's daughter. So if you think your family has some trauma and stuff in it, your father-in-law probably is not attempting murder on you. Just want to point that out. Maybe, I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. But David was entangled in the family of the king he was anointed to replace. David's response to attempted murder, even though he had killed lions, bears, a giant, his response was to run and hide. He was running for his life and hiding from his life. He was a national hero, but he was also the nation's most wanted. Although he was innocent of wrongdoing, he was being hunted. All the while penning masterpieces of praise to God. He hid in caves with criminals. He acquired a crew of misfit mercenaries. He hid among the national enemies, pretending to be someone he wasn't, attempting to make his enemy's enemy his friend. All the while dangerously close to committing treason. Eventually, through God's providence and benevolence, he would become king. A king who would unite the tribes together under one rule, usher in peace to the kingdom, eliminate their enemies. But during his kingship, when the threats on his life no longer existed, David would commit sins that would have terrible consequences for his family and for the nation as a whole. He would commit adultery and murder. And he penned a beautiful confession of those sins in Psalm 51. Even with all of this, Scripture describes David as a man after God's own heart. And even though he was a shepherd, poet, warrior, king, I don't know, you might be one of those, but not all four, he still wasn't that different from you and me. Although much of his life was way more extreme than ours, there were many times David didn't know who he was what he was supposed to do, how he was supposed to go about doing it. Many of those nights running and hiding from his life, he wrote tormented songs of despair. David asked, who am I? A lot. I would suggest maybe more than anyone else in the Bible. We see these examples in Psalm 8, 4. What is a human being that you remember him, a son of man that you look after him? Then in 1 Samuel 18, David responded, who am I? What is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? Is it trivial in your sight to become the king's son-in-law? I'm a poor commoner. Even though he had been anointed to be king, he saw himself differently. As king, he still asked the same questions of who am I? In Psalm 144, we read, Lord, what is a human that you care for him? A son of man that you think of him. A human's like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. And then in 2 Samuel 7, 18, King David went in, sat in the Lord's presence and said, who am I, Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? His questions could easily be taken as humility. And I think there's humility involved in there. I think David was an incredibly humble person. But I think at many points he was lost and did not know who he was and how he was supposed to live out this promise of God in his life wondering why the circumstances didn't echo the promise. Wondering, God, who am I? What are you doing? David honestly struggled to find himself at points. He had great success and great failures. Does that sound familiar to anyone in here? Does that feel familiar to you? David had ups and downs with his identity, with knowing who he was and how life was playing out for him. And I think if David can ask that question, who am I? I think, I think it's okay for us to ask the same question too. So today, uh, I want to talk about, I have two points for you today about lessons learned from the life of David, about his identity. So point number one, are we ready? Are you with me? Are we good? A2, you with me? Yes, all right, here we go. Point number one, I am not the author or the main character of my story. I'm not the author or the main character. When David was looking to honor God with what he was doing, he found great success. He he slayed a giant because he's doing it on behalf of God. 
But what his problems came when he lost the plot and he made himself the main character. He responded out of fear, out of anxiety. He ran away without seeking God. He slept with someone else's wife. As I was preparing this message, I was kind of wondering, is there a nicer way to say, hey, look, you're not the main character. And I'm like, there's not, there isn't. I'm just going to tell you that you have food in your teeth and we'll move on, right? I'm that kind of guy that would do that. There's so many of us in this room that say, we're following God, I'm following God. I'm in God's story, but we're really living our own story. We're wondering why God's not around. We don't feel his presence. He's there, but we don't sense it because we stepped out of the storyline and lost the plot. And we've made it about ourselves. On Instagram this week, there was a, a birthday wish, just a simple wish from a mom to her daughter. And I'm going to read it to you right now because I think it reveals a lot of things that we may believe that aren't true. She says to her, this date's special because you came into this world and filled our lives with joy. Today marks the start of a new path of your life. The story of your life's entirely your own. Only you can determine who continues in the next chapters. Only you decide the plot of this story. You are the writer, producer, and the main actress of your story. Be bold and determined so that one day you'll look back and be proud of how you chose to write and live your life. I love you so much. Happy birthday. Y'all, this is a lie that we believe, that we somehow have the power, the authority, and even the responsibility to author our own story. And it is a burden that we should not live with. So you're not the author or the main character of the story. Because if you are the author, if you're the main character of your story, and it's solely up to you, you are now in competition with 7.9 billion other stories out there. And competition does not work. You will never measure up. You might get 7.89 billion high. You're in the top spot there in your story competition, but you'll never feel like you've arrived. Because if you're the author and the main character of your story, you can discard people that aren't integral to your story. You don't feel it with this person, see ya. I don't like this part of you, bye bye If you're the author and the story and the main character of your story, you can have whatever moral code is advantageous to you. You start living off your own passions and desires. It doesn't matter because it's your story. You get to do what you want. You can also be the judge of other people's intentions. It doesn't matter what they meant. It's how you took it. So you, you live in offense. You live in anger and a sense of revenge. If you're the author of your own story, you're the victim rather than the perpetrator in all of it. It always just happens to me. Why does everything happen to me? You're never wrong. When you're the author and the main character, you can absolve yourself from wrongdoing. Oh, I didn't mean it to go that way. That was an accident. Forgiveness, compassion, humility aren't necessary when you're the author and main character of your own story. But here is the problem. A worldview that holds that I am the author and the main character of my own story, it doesn't work. It has no place for tragedy. It has no place for pain, for suffering. When something bad happens and I'm supposed to be the author and main character, well, I've failed. I can't author a good story. I don't, I don't have a paradigm for how to work out something painful or something bad that happened to me. I don't, I don't have any way to work that out if I'm constantly grinding to try to work out the story. If it's our responsibility to author the story, we end up feeling like a failure because failures always happen. Pain always happens in the story. We'll never, ever measure up. And so we either strive really hard or we give up. The truth is we know we all screw up, right? Can we be honest in here, all of us? Anybody in here screw up before? Yeah, okay. All right. Well, that's not very many hands, y'all are lies. 
A lot of our lives are on, honestly pretty broken. We come in here because we're like, we, I need something. My life is just messed up. I want to find something different. We all have broken lives where we've caused pain or received pain. We're all broken storytellers. And the truth is this, is that broken storytellers live broken stories. And when we feel the pressure of trying to author that and fix it and put it back together, that pressure can consume us. In Psalm 8, 4 through 6, as we read earlier, what is a human being that you remember him? A son of man that you look after him. You made him little less than God and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands. You put everything under his feet. Did you catch that? You're made a little less than God. You and I are not God. As my mom would say, know your place. Know your place. When we try to take the story and write it for ourselves, we are taking over for God. We do not, we do not have the ability to author our story. We don't hold the future in our hands. Did you know that narcissism is on the rise? You all chuckle because you've seen it, right? We see narcissism everywhere. We like to be the central, as C.S. Lewis uses, uses a phrase as, we are incessant autobiographers, constantly involved in our own story. But it's estimated that over the last 30 years, narcissism, personality disorder, which is a uh, medically diagnosed thing, has, has gone from an estimated 3% of the population to 10, to 10%. Many of, many of us are familiar with the idea of grandiose narcissism, right? I, I am superior to you, and I am entitled to all of your, well, not worship, but I'm entitled to all of your focus. I'm the main thing in my story. But there's also a vulnerable narcissism, which is characterized by hypersensitivity to criticism and a constant need for reassurance. Both of those are trying to be the center of the story. And I feel like it's very consuming for so many of us when we're trying to tell a story, to be the main character of the story, to achieve and dream and attain all of these things that we've been told we can for our whole life, that it's too much. So there's a train of thought that's been around since the Enlightenment, which is either that humans are gods or they're merely animals. Michael Allen Gillespie says, one strain of Enlightenment thought came to believe that humans were gods the other strain saw them as beasts or even mere matter in motion, driven by desire and sheer self-interest. A very pessimistic view of humanity today is that we're all just culturally constructed meat puppets. You ever thought about that? That you're just an animal that's been socially conditioned to be able to, that we don't all murder each other in this room, just through social conditioning over time. Here's the thing, though. If we're gods... Why hasn't anything gotten better? <laughs> and if we're simply meat puppets, why do we feel this deep longing within us that there's something more? And some of the statistics that have come out lately about mental health, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, they're just staggering. I came upon a chart last night that's gonna go up on the screen here. This chart took my breath away. It's, uh, related to anxiety prevalence among different generations. So I'm right on the edge of that green one. We're the only one that hasn't felt, hasn't had an increase in anxiety over the last few years. Ages 18 to 25. I hurt for you. So even just this week as I was preparing this message, I haven't had a I've spoken here a few times, but I haven't had a message where I've felt as much anxiety as I did this week. Anxiety changed me in the way that I responded to others around me, in the way that I interact, the way that I even thought through my day. A lot of my focus went, how do I get rid of this feeling? That, a lot of energy went towards, how do I get rid of this feeling? It's just sitting in me. And so if you are a person that's feeling anxiety, that deep angst kind of in your gut that never really feels, seems to be able to go away, can I 
proclaim over you today. There is freedom in God from that. There is freedom from that in God. He wants to proclaim that, you, that worry, anxiety, that deep-rooted, like, constant angst, he wants to free you from that. He truly does. One of the other statistics I read was that the inc increase of emergency room visits for self-harm for 10 to 14-year-olds, 10 to 14-year-olds is astounding. It has gone up so much in the last 10 years. It looks like a mountain as you're climbing up it. And for girls, it's way more significant even than for boys. So maybe, just maybe, telling our children they can be anything they want, anything, the story is theirs to narrate, maybe that's a bit too much. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe there's a little bit too much pressure to tr for us trying to author our own stories. Yeah. Maybe it's a lot of work yeah. to try to just make it through the day, let alone have this beautiful, amazing story that, that we're then given a tool that's a constant comparison with someone else's story. 7.9 billion of them. This isn't a diatribe against social media. It has its benefits. But if we're trying to tell our own story and in constant comparison with somebody else's, we've missed the plot. God is asking us to be included into his story. Look what Psalm 8, 4 through 6 says about you and me. It says that we're a little less than God and crowned with glory and honor. Did you catch that? We're crowned with glory and honor. Psalm 8 harkens back to Genesis and the creation story. And if you know the creation story, humanity is created on the sixth and final day. It is, humanity is the ultimate of creation. Creation went from good to very good on the sixth day when humanity was created. And this is what the Bible tells us. We're amazing. We're a wonder. We're different and better than animals. Life has been breathed into us by the very mouth of God. We're deeply loved by the creator of it all. We're incredibly important. You are incredibly important. You are the pinnacle of creation. But you're still created. You're still created. Repeat after me. I am not the author. I am not the main character, I am not the main character. but God is. Yeah. This brings me to point number two. God authored me into his story on purpose. God authored me into his story on purpose. You are not a cosmic accident. No matter what your family situation was or is, you are not an accident. You have been authored into his story on purpose. I talk to a lot of men. I am a man. And um, therefore, I talk with a lot of men. A lot of men who are honestly hurting and confused about what it looks like to be a man. Some of us have some bravado behind us, some big energy, a lot of words, and it ends up being a facade really behind it. We're broken and messed up. Some of us just hide in passivity and shame, not knowing what to do and how to get out of it. I speak of this as a man because I'm, like I said, I'm a man, but I do, women, I imagine you feel some of the similarities of facades and storytelling and not feeling like you measure up and not knowing exactly how you fit in and all of that. For me, I, I've felt deeply kind of that confusion about what it looks like to be a man because I never felt like I really fit in I didn't like to hunt. I don't like MMA. Um, I don't grunt a lot. Um, I, can, I can grow a decent beard, but um, so I've, testosterone's probably okay in there with that. But like, I've never necessarily felt like I fit as a man because of the images that were being portrayed that I was supposed to measure up to. And I think a lot of us in here feel that same thing. And so I had, there's a, there's a time, and there's a time sometimes we feel like we need to take control and reauthor our life so that that weird feeling inside us, we can correct that for ourselves, and we can reauthor who we are. I mean, I remember in junior high, I would 
one year I was a jock, the next year I was a prep, the next year I was a metalhead, like just trying to fit into my groups, right? I was, metalhead, for a little while, yep. And we, we try to fit in. But I submitted my identity to God. I said, God, I don't know what it looks like to be a man. I'm getting like all of this stuff all over the place. Can you help me understand what it's like, what it is to be a man? So number one, I got pointed to Jesus, right? Jesus was a man, lived a perfect life. If I want to, my life to resemble that of a man, I should probably look to Jesus, who taught confidently and loved tenderly. God put men around me from all different kinds of walks of life, some who liked to hunt and liked MMA, others who were dancers and artists. They had tenderness and compassion within them. I've learned from all of these men, they're all so different and so beautiful. And so I say in here, we are trying to figure out who we are. We got to look to God and submit our story to him. If you are a guy and you felt some of that, what I'm describing, can I encourage you to come to our men's one night in 10 days? Yes. Pastor John Tyson, is he is um, a man who listens to God's spirit, knows God's word, and has such a tender heart for what we are finding, the situation we're finding ourselves in. I think it would be really encouraging for you to be there. But whether a man or a woman, we've all been placed in this place and time for a purpose. I was, as I mentioned, I've been sort of feeling anxious a lot this week. And so I was praying, God, why do I feel this way? What, what can you speak over me? And, and he said a simple phrase to me, and I, I honestly believe it's for you today too. And so he just said, I've got you. I've got you. So God has got you. God has got you. Now, David was anointed king in 1 Samuel 16. Scholars estimate he was between the ages of 10 and 14. You guys over here, 10 and 14, could you imagine being anointed king? And then having to fight a giant? Good luck with that. But it went 20 chapters and 20 years until he was actually made king. There's a lot of life in there. He went through a lot of it. And his life was really broken. He made some poor decisions. I just wanted to read a little bit from you. I didn't do this in the other services, and I just really felt compelled to do this. He wrote in Psalm 51 this confession. I'll read a little bit from you, for you. Be gracious to me, God. This is Psalm 51. According to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion, completely wash away my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin, for I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. Against you, you alone, I've sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you're right when you pass sentence. You're blameless when you judge. David found himself outside of God's story. And in this moment, he put himself back inside God's story by saying, I wrote this myself and it's not according to your plan. I've missed the plot, God. I want to be brought back into the plot. And then King David, he went before God's presence and God made a promise to him that his throne would not depart, that his family line would never leave the throne. It would be on the throne forever. He, David says in 2 Samuel seven eighteen, King David went in, sat in the Lord's presence and said, who am I, Lord God? What's my house that you've brought me this far? And God promised David that his lineage would be upon the throne forever. And 28 generations later, Jesus the Messiah yeah. came from the line of David and now reigns on the throne forever. Yeah. God is a God of redeeming stories. He redeemed the story through Jesus. He wants to redeem your story through Jesus. We just need to say, God, I've missed the plot. Right. Yep. I've been striving so hard or I don't see any hope in it and I just gave up. I'm trying to write the story and it's a giant mess and I don't know what to do. God, I just want to be back in your plot. Yep. I want to be in the story that you're trying to tell. 
So whose story are you telling? Because broken storytellers live broken stories, but broken stories can be reauthored. Yep. Broken stories can be reauthored. When um, I was 11 years old, my grandpa passed away. He lived back east, and my dad went back east to pack up his house. <clears throat> and he had shipped a bunch of the stuff that he wanted to keep as heirlooms uh, back to our house. Uh, I lived in Washington State at the time. And I've never seen my dad as emotional as he was the day those boxes arrived, those damaged boxes with China in them. And as he opened them up and pulled out these fragmented pieces, I watched his eyes well up with tears. I heard the anger in his voice. He stormed out of the room. He was so hurt over these broken uh, things of his past. I watched him sit at the table trying to glue these pieces back together. They never quite matched up. This is one of them. I don't know if you can see the seams and cracks over here that my dad glued back together with glue that's now turned brown. There's chips still out of the plate. I wouldn't eat off of this. I don't know what that glue has in it. My dad was trying so hard to put this back together and it's kind of back together. You still see evidence of the brokenness. I came across this artist last fall. His name's Robert Strati. His story goes like this. At the end of 2020, a plate from the artist's wife's late mother broke and sat on Strati's kitchen island for several months. Unsure what to do with something that had sentimental value but was beyond repair, it stayed on the island, moving around to make way for everyday objects like the mail and domestic tasks like cutting vegetables. With time, Strati started to think about the kinds of stories contained in such an object, which could be told through the plate's surviving fragments they made their way into a studio and onto a blank sheet of paper. One day, Strati picked up a pen and started working on Fragmented, exploring the possibilities of broken things and the stories that can evolve from them. So this is what he put together. He would take these broken plates and then, with his gift as an artist, expand the story on, retell it in a way with, of great beauty, beauty that did not exist when the plate was unbroken. He brought the story beyond the perimeter of the plate. When my dad was trying to put this together, he just wanted the plate to be together again. But when we put our story in the hands of the artist, into the author, he doesn't want to put it back together again. He wants to tell a brand new story. A story that goes beyond the perimeter of what you could ever imagine. Yeah. Doesn't need to be constrained within the confines of your imagination. God has so much to tell through you and in you. He wants you to be part of his story and your story can be reauthored because of Jesus. In Hebrews 12, we read this. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Today, your life can change. If you're tired of trying to tell your story, if you want to say, Jesus, I want to be part of your story, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that right now. So I'm going to ask everyone in here in A2, if you just bow your head, close your eyes. Our team's going to be getting up and leaving the room, but would you please stay? Someone in here needs to hear this and have this moment. If you're tired of trying to tell your own story and you want to be part of Jesus' story, you need a new author for your life. You need G Jesus to make something beautiful out of what is broken. Would everyone in this room and in A2, would you pray this prayer after me? It's not about the words, but it's about the heart that's in it. Pray with me. Jesus, I'm giving you my story. I'm giving you the past. I'm giving you my story right now. I'm trusting you to author my future. Save me, change me, make me new. I will follow you all the days of my life. 
I'm turning from my way. I'm putting my story in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen.